the clouds have completely vanished and the sun is finally free to let out its beautiful golden rays and hopefully warm us up at some point because it's a little bit nippy this morning. My name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me today is Paul and we are here at Ajuma Private Game Reserve doing this wonderful live and interactive safari so please remember to send in your questions and your comments and we look forward to chatting to you over the next couple of hours. Now this is where we left the wild dogs yesterday afternoon. They were beautifully just trotting down the road off in that distance and I thought well why don't we just come and have a look for them again but since we've been out we've already picked up on male leopard tracks they were coming down from quarantine uh, the open plains behind camp however they did seem to peter off towards the northeast and went towards Ingwe Alley um, and I don't know whose those could be because there were obviously two sets of male leopard tracks yesterday. One we know was of course from Tortoise Pan because that's who Tessa was sitting with but there was still another individual in the area that was causing quite a big stir. So lots of excitement could potentially unravel this morning but I don't want to jinx it just yet. So let us drive down the road and now I need to try and pick up on some on some more tracks and no we're not and then hopefully we can find the, the dogs. I do actually just want to have a look at what these tracks are. What are these tracks? Betty Blue, you've said we're starting the show right this morning with Unrise. You're absolutely 100% correct. It, uh, it's definitely a lot easier to wake up when you've got the birds chirping and you've obviously got quite a stunning view like we, we have here. When it's cloudy and miserable, then sometimes you think, oh, please say that my alarm is not going off just yet. But uh, yeah, no, this morning was very easy to get up. Let's keep them just double checking. A lot of hyena activity. We could hear them calling the entire night, but there was lots of action around. So I'm sort of going east. Tess has gone west. And uh, she's going to be looking out for all sorts of tracks too. Okay, I'm going to keep my eyes peeled for flashes of white or track on the ground. And I bet Tess is doing the same thing. Oh, good luck on that side, Taylor. I hope that you managed to find that leopard. Also, please, will you come here and tell the Swenson Spurfowl that the sun is in fact out and it doesn't have to look as though it's hiding from something. <laughs> good morning, everybody. It is a lovely start to the day. And uh, maybe the Spurfowl doesn't agree yet, but I think soon enough it is going to be in the sun. I don't know why it's in a shady spot on a termite mound, but anyway, I think it's just having a bit of a slow morning and that's totally fine. My name is Tess, I'll be taking you out on Rusty for the morning. Behind the camera is Eagle and hopefully this morning safari is, if it's half as successful as yesterday afternoons, that is a cracking safari. I'll be very, very happy with that. But I'm wondering if those male leopard tracks that, um, that Taylor has are perhaps from Mulawati or the other male that we had tracks of yesterday following Tortoise Pan because I don't know if Tortoise Pan would push onto quarantine, although maybe he would. When I left him last night, he was pretty much a little bit further north than where I am now, on Zoe's Road, approaching Vuyatela Access. So that's very close by to quarantine. But I suppose as well, if we think about the fact that there was a male leopard literally on the heels of Tortoise Pan, his tracks on top of our vehicle tracks, it could have been either of them on quarantine doing a little bit of an extra scent marking mission if they know another male's in the area, especially after rain. Interesting. I hope Taylor finds him so we can see who it is. That would be awesome. We haven't found tracks going on to Vuyatela Access from this side, so Tortoise Pan cut off before he got to Vuyatela Access, but we couldn't see the direction, unfortunately. Uh, where I passed him, he was off the road, just off the road, and so I would imagine he just carried on from there and would have turned maybe back west but I haven't checked for your tele-access all the way to Sandy Patch. This spurfowl is definitely hoping that there is not a leopard around, but I suppose a termite mound is a good vantage point to wake up slowly. And of course it is another day of weekend at the waterholes, so 
We are definitely going to be checking them out today. They brought us so much luck yesterday. And perhaps today will be half as lucky. Look how well camouflaged that spur file is because it's in the shade. As soon as its face is in the sun, you'll see that red popping. But anyway, we're going to leave the spur file to wake up, but he looks like he needs some privacy. So we'll send you over to Chris to say good morning in Pridelands. Good morning everybody and look at this fantastic scene that greets us on a lovely morning out here at Eco Training Pridelands and it's very clear today uh, it's still quite breezy obviously with this sort of weather system we had for the last couple of days it's quite chilly in the morning I must say it's the first morning that I actually had a jacket on other than the time that it was raining it's quite fresh uh, and it will heat up rather quickly and we're looking at a nice mild summer's day probably in the region of about 29 degrees later in the day and our plan is to also move from water hole to water hole uh, we're gonna check tracks around not only water holes but also around puddles and and mud wallows because obviously like I said yesterday there's quite a few puddles here after the rain and the animals will utilize them quite sub quite substantially. My name is Chris and with me on CamOps is Panda. Right, so just look at that beautiful... Just the way the mountains are illuminated with the early morning sun. So while we don't really get much of a sunrise because it's already up, I think within about a, two weeks or so we'll start seeing the good sun rises again because remember the sun will rise later every morning now since we have passed the summer solstice on the 21st of December so the days are now getting shorter slowly but surely and we haven't seen the mountains in the last three days because of clouds Just this lovely scene where the trees are the impala starting their early day activities. There's a forktailed drongo that's already flying around as well. And hoping for a fly or two that they can snatch. Good morning, Jenna. And Jenna's just sent very jealous of the Impala, they just get to have the best views in the mornings. Indeed. Indeed, Jenna. And you can hear a grey at a bush right there. <whistles> oh, no, it's quiet. Oh, no, there it goes. Very pretty bird. Very common, but difficult to spot. Very secretive in their habits. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly but surely just meander through to Leopard Dam, work the area around there, work the northern boundary, back to HQ Water Hole, check for perhaps any lion tracks there. And we'll check from there. We'll plan from there, whether we'll come back to Ndlovu Dam, we know there's a lot of elephants around, so I'm convinced that we will see some elephants at one of the water rolls at some stage. Very tranquil scene. Lovely way to start an easy Sunday morning. Amy is asking what is my favorite smell and sound in the morning. Well, Amy, 
my favorite smell in the morning i can tell you there's many which just does have a very different odor in the mornings it's very fresh and clean it's difficult to describe in particular but if there's one thing that really gets my heart pumping is early morning driving around and you get that characteristic smell of leopard urine that's fresh uh, it's got literally an odor similar to baked popcorn so that's really a smell that I like and it's often very pungent and strong in early mornings and another sound for me that I love early mornings is the morning chorus of all the birds but there's one particular sound as well often this is the time we will hear lions roar that's also something that I enjoy quite a bit and that hours just before we start getting ready so like four three four ish often when they roar quite a lot and you can lying in my tent and you can literally hear all the sounds that's something I truly enjoy Everybody's just appreciative of a little bit of sun. You can see the impalas all moving into the sun. So we'll be doing the same. Here at Wild Earth, we know it's not always possible to watch your favorite show live. If catching up on safaris is critical to you, then download the Wild Earth app and watch the catch-ups here first. Catch-ups are available on our app before YouTube. And in addition, there are cut-downs of each show for those who only have time to watch the best bits. <laughs> That's incredibly cute. Download the brand new Wild Earth app today and don't miss out. Weather like this makes me think of crisp winter mornings. After the rain, even in summer, overnight the temperature can plummet because everything is wet and cool. And now, now it is just so beautiful. Chilly enough that uh, the hands feel a bit of a chill and a bit of a nip. Need the jacket, that's for sure. 
but by the time it gets to lunchtime, it'll be a different story. But I love these after rain mornings. The first day of proper sunshine. The freedom of taking off the rain roof. It's an amazing feeling. I haven't managed to find any tracks on Zoe's road, so we've been looking for leopard tracks and lion tracks. We don't know where those lions went last night, but the last tracks were in fact crossing Zoe's towards quarantine. But we haven't found any tracks coming out anywhere yet. So maybe the lions are still in the block, or maybe we just haven't done enough roads yet. It's still a bit early. But either way, I'm hoping that we do manage to catch up with them today and figure out which lions they even are because we were trying to do a process of elimination yesterday of where the different lions are and it sounds like most of them the Talamati breakaways and S8 were closer to Simambili sounds like the Nguhuma sub-adults are somewhere in the south we think that the lone male that did that kind of patrol right the way through Juma that Taylor and I were both tracking we think that was Mohawk actually that we could hear calling and then moving around because we know that S8 was at the time not on the property because there was a confirmed sighting of him off the property at the same time that this was all happening. So we think that it was actually Mohawk and walked up here in fact and cut off right here where I am following the buffalo which is some lovely buffalo tracks crossing out. Trying to work out which other lines may have crossed in yesterday after the buffaloes. That's been an interesting process. We still haven't put our fingers on it. Yola, I am so happy that you are ready. Tracking is definitely the theme. After such a busy day on the reserve yesterday, if you think about the amount of tracks that we have the possibility of looking for this morning and using, it's one of the most exciting feelings as a guide. It really is. <laughs> because we had lions on the property, we had wild dogs on the property. Not that anyone actually found the lions, but their tracks went in and did not come out. So we had lions and wild dogs and two leopards on the property, plus buffalo, and I'm sure there were elephants at some point. There must have been somewhere. <laughs> so we had an incredible amount of wildlife on the property yesterday. And it's just after that rain, everything kicks up, right? There's fresh, fresh water, fresh greenery, cause to move in St. Mark again. So the amount of tracks that we have the possibility of following today is just so good. <laughs> so many possibilities. So I'm using that to weave my way towards Treehouse Dam. That's where I got lucky yesterday, but I want to check all of these areas for any of those tracks that we're looking for. The wild dogs, the lions, the leopards. I'm going to zigzag. hyena tracks here including baby hyena tracks little ones so some of the cubs from the Duke McLan have been out and about disappointingly I've checked the den on little Gari every day from Gari Main and have yet to see any activity there this cycle but apparently it is still active somebody saw a mother and a little one suckling a few days ago but by the time we got there they had moved so I don't know who it was More hyena tracks. Okay, Tess standing by. Yeah, Taylor, uh, just a quick one on the area. Have you been scratching in on Juma? I just want to check if these phones are yours or not. <laughs> Stand by for one minute. <laughs> okay, so I don't know where I'm sending you because I was busy listening on the radio at the same time that Jarrett was talking in my ear, but I know it's something in the sun, so that's always a good way to spend the morning.
we just decided that this is such a lovely scene and quite a lot of birds joining the impala here on zebra clearing with this lovely view of the mountains and it is just lucky to nice to see just what birds do for instance this dove now sitting in the tree there at the tip of a branch on this weeping bourbine just catching that first morning's sun now with birds sunning themselves is another important aspect of maintaining their feathers in combination with a few other things um, so the sun much like it does with us helps with vitamin D production most mammals if there was rain or fog or mist during the night it's also a good means for them to dry out the feathers and maintain them again so the feathers interlock again nicely to create the airfoil in order to sustain flight and there's a few other ways that they also maintain their feathers they will dust bathe themselves which helps to get rid of all sort of dead cells and pieces of feathers that are not intact as well as parasites like mites and so forth that can potentially cause small holes in the airfoil also do what we call anting so they physically go down to the ground and let ants crawl over their feathers where they secrete certain acids which also helps to maintain feathers and then obviously preening most birds have the preened land with the preening oil and combing it with the beak shaking and then very important to physically bathe in water as well to get the feathers to get a physical clean but for now this dove and that is a laughing dove by the way some of those who's recently joined our our show that's one of our most common doves out here Hello there, Tyler. Tyler wants to know the differences between doves and pigeons. So generally speaking, they are very much the same family of birds. And generally speaking, the smaller ones are usually the doves and the larger species, usually the pigeons. Other than that, there's no physical scientific difference or taxonomic difference. It is more a colloquial tend to categorize them by size. So that's something that came out of history rather than it doesn't hold any scientific or taxonomical relevance. They are actually the same things. In fact, some doves used to be called pigeons and now called doves and vice versa so it's basically a colloquial english sort of naming or, 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 or uh, name categorizing to to group them by size so the larger ones we refer to as pigeons and the smaller ones usually doves but other than that they are very much the same family of birds Kelly is just mentioning there that loves a bit of birding in the morning uh, I do as well I love birding any time of the day but I think after this we'll we'll start in all earnest 
and head towards Leopard Down and see what's happening up there. Maybe we'll get some lion tracks there, or leopard tracks, you never know. And tracking will be tricky, because the soil's quite hard at the moment, there's not much of a dust layer. So seeing the imprints of the cat's footprints, or actually a toe prints, they don't walk on the entire foot, they walk on their toes. And there's some kudu joining us. Which is marvellous. I hope, I hope you find those lion tracks, Chris. We've got a bit of a bird party on this side, and we're just enjoying the fact that we can see the tops of the trees without the roof, which is brilliant. But also, there are just so many birds calling and sitting around. This is, it looks like a forktail drongo, a cape glossy starling on the right-hand side, potentially. And then on the kind of middle section, that white and brownish gray bird, that's actually a ground scraper thrush. That's not being a ground scraper thrush today, it's being a, a tree thrush. Don't often see them that high up in the trees. But because there are so many beautiful sounds around us, I want you to just have a listen because the dawn chorus this morning has carried on for ages. you see even though we can't see many birds we can hear very many birds everything from woodland kingfishers to orioles to hornbills colors it is just so stunning I hope we get a view of that aureole bright yellow bird absolutely stunning especially in early morning light birding this time of the day is one of my favorite things to do I think this, every time you come to me, I'm going to end up stepping outside the car. I'm just still trying to figure out where the dogs went. Uh, it looks like they might have run here, though. Just double checking, because lots of hyena tracks, too. Yes. This was all dogs that have run here. And they've gone that way, so I just need to check did they go down the Mulati or did they go end up going up Batalier Road? No, so let me just quickly try and reverse. I don't, I, you're in reverse, and then I, I give up, get angry at the car, I try not to get angry. I'm enjoying my coffee in the sunshine and Paul's wonderful sense of humor, which. It makes you feel alive. We'll just quickly check here and then decide if we're gonna go or ah oh. oh okay we're gonna try and figure out where these dogs went but off you go to Tess in the meantime. Good luck, Taylor. Find dogs, find dogs, find dogs. Any day 
ever is made by finding wild dogs. Ooh, thunk, thunk. So much water. Oh, phenomenal. It must make the world of difference. Literally life and death difference sometimes to animals to have this much water. It has been an exceptionally good year last year and we've started off on a great note with the rain as well. Oh. We were just chatting on this side and saying it is such a good morning for reptiles. I wonder if we're going to find a snake somewhere sunning itself on a branch or a termite mound. Because as soon as it starts warming up today, even, I mean, when we're moving the breeze is cold, especially in the shade, but sitting still in the sun, we're actually starting to warm up quite nicely. It feels very nice and toasty. So I'm sure there's going to be reptiles doing the exact same thing. After a few days of cold, they need to warm their bodies back up. Sitting in the sun is one of my favorite pastimes, especially early in the morning. If you've got a cup of coffee and you can sit with your back to the sun, or if you want to sit with your face to it too, great. It's just so nice. I don't know if that was Billy Wild Guy or Silly Wild Guy, but I'm going to go with Billy Wild Guy because that was the first thing I heard. Animals that use the sun in creative ways, I'm going to go with bees. Ah, yes, Billy with the bee. Thank you so much, Jared. I'm going to go with bees, Billy Wild Guy, because they do a little dance. I don't know if you've ever seen it. There's some amazing diagrams of it. If you haven't on videos, you should definitely go and look it up. It's almost impossible for us to show you. But bees can use the sun to tell each other where they found a great source of pollen or nectar. They do a little dance, the bee dance. So essentially what they do is from the hive, they navigate somewhere. Once they've found a great stash of flowers together or anywhere that's got a really decent amount of, of food for them to go back and produce honey, they go back to the hive, so they measure it in relation to the sun and the hive. They go back to the hive and they will do a dance that angles. So they kind of zigzag and then they go around and come back. And they zigzag and they go around and come back. And they zigzag and they go around and come back. And that angle that they are zigzagging, turning and coming back, indicates to whichever bee is leaving the hive, in relation to the sun we're going in that angle and you should find the, the plants that we have found as the source for the day. And the length of the wiggle will also tell the other bees how far to travel. How impressive is that? It's one of the most amazing and mind-blowing things I learned as an entomologist. And never really got to see it in person, but the amount of videos that I saw of people that did manage to document it, once that bee comes back to the hive, it communicates that to the colony. And you can actively see within the colony the bees that are dancing. They kind of go out and scout and then they come back and they do this little dance. And in relation to the sun and the exit to the hive, the direction that they went, they'll use a little dance. I like it. But if you can think of some cool ones, Billy Bob, please share with me. That just happens to be my ultimate favorite. I think the little bee dance is an incredible feat of nature. How do bees know to communicate distance and direction to the other bees to go and find flowers? It's so cool. Ah, it's got my memory sparked on a whole lot of amazing things. There are tracks here. What have we got? Oh, this is the second set of leopard traps. Tracks. Leopard traps. Wow, leopard trap. <laughs> leopard. It's going well. Leopard tracks that we had yesterday. So this is very close to where I found tortoise pans tracks initially and in fact I found them just here you can see where my tracks go off the road <laughs> from yesterday I found tortoise pans tracks here and then found tortoise pan in the block here coming back after losing him 
we were looking and thinking this is a, a little bit too fresh again there's no way he's done that loop because he went north and then we obviously found him again on Rebecca's Road coming back here there were leopard tracks on top of my vehicle tracks next to his leopard tracks so there's another male following him and that must have been the salivation that we were seeing maybe that was what made him decide to move this is in fact exactly where we have the leopard tracks on top of the vehicle tracks I'll show you I will show you let's turn the game drive radio down so it doesn't pop on while I am off the vehicle so tortoise pans tracks Where's a good spot to show you? Yeah, this is pretty good. Okay, so Tortoise Pan's tracks go along this track, and in fact, I drove over them, and they come out here and carry on. When we came back, the second set of tracks are these ones on top of the vehicle tracks. So this was my initial line, and then I'd driven over them a little bit, or I'd reversed and come back. This is the second leopard on top of my vehicle tracks from yesterday. These are Rusty's tracks. There's the second leopard track. And here is Tortoise Pan's track. So Tortoise Pan walked this line. The other leopard walked that line, literally almost on top of each other. So there's Tortoise Pan. There's the other one, which we think is Mulwati. Both going towards Treehouse Dam. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> I got so excited when I found those second set of tracks yesterday. Oh. I felt like I was having a superhero day. I think it was Larry the Lightning Antero Scale. S scale, Snail. I think you brought us some good luck. Larry. Larry brought us the leopard luck. Aw, oh, Sifley and MC, thank you very much. I love you. You're a superhero. <laughs> was one of the most amazing feelings I think I've had in a while in the bush yesterday pulling off that find of tortoise pan at a distance through the bush seeing him <laughs> and reversing like that and then in my gut knowing there was something going on and finding the second set of leopard tracks so good <laughs> one of the best feelings you'll ever get in the bush is when you find tracks and work hard and find the animal and the story plays out as though as though you had written it before it happened it's just incredible join us from the 23rd till the 27th of january for a week of back to school special safaris tailored specifically towards our future conservationists. Our naturalists will exclusively be taking questions from schools across the globe. Tune in for some entertaining animal education to ease you back into the school year because fostering the upcoming generations of conservationists matters.
I don't have anything yet. Nope. Nope. There we go. Okay, let's go up Cheetah Cut Line. There's a vehicle that's behind me now coming up on Cheetah Cut Line. Oh my goodness, this earpiece. I'm not winning today. Technology really does not like me. Okay, let's just see. So, obviously what's one of the things you have to kind of do when searching for dogs is to try and work as a team and you know there's no point everybody driving in exactly the same direction because dogs are quite vocal so there's always a chance that you could end up hearing them you know especially if one does make a kill or one gets lost uh, so I've been stopping and listening quite a bit listening out for alarm calls uh, of course listening for the dogs themselves so we'll just go up here go towards Bufflesuk Dam just have a little scratch and then I'll probably come back down again maybe check along central and sort of a bit more to the west and just just have a look see now i'm getting ahead of myself for me i'm going you're going too fast you're going to miss other wildlife as well which of course we're looking for so we'll see gosh it would have been so funny to have seen those wild dogs running around with the uh with a giraffe that would have been so entertaining anyways we're on way to a water hole tess is already at one i wonder what she's got yay we arrived at the water hole my first four hour sunday of weekend at the water holes i'm excited and most importantly dewey is back Dewey's been in Gauri Dam for a couple of days. And now Dewey has come back to Treehouse Dam. Isn't it wonderful after so many days of intense rain and wind to see the surface of this dam almost looking like glass? Dewey must be very happy going to be a stunning day. He can play, he can come out of the water and sunbathe. I'm sure he's missed that. Hippos enjoy sunbathing a lot. And he can just relax. Look at those pink ears. I'm hoping an ox picker comes down and sits on his head. But I've been having a look every time I see him. I have never seen a tick in Dewey's ears. I've seen ticks on hippos out of the water, but mostly in the folds behind the legs or underneath the tail, which would make sense because if he's walking around in the grass at night, he's gonna pick up some ticks. And then things like, things like terrapins actually help to control them underwater. But I suppose ox pickers might even take ticks off of his ears if they land on his head to drink. But he does seem to be a very well, well-groomed male hippo. It even looks like he trims the hairs on his ears. They are quite perfectly conditioned in the same length all round. And MC, <laughs> you've got me in stitches this morning. Apparently, Dewey's ears look just like Jarrett's ears, and Jarrett is the lovely voice in my ear this morning. That is delightful. I'll never get that image out of my head now. Thank you, Sitle. Sorry, Jarrett. I can't say I disagree. <laughs> Very cute ears, though. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Ears are well yes, Jared's ears must be very well groomed, yeah. That's a good point, Eagle. Maybe a little bit hairy. <laughs> but it's just such a gorgeous day at the dam. We're going to spend quite a bit of time here this morning. There's some epic birding going on. Maybe Dewey's going to get active. I'm hoping that we get a glimpse of the woodpecker that I can hear tapping away in the background. Hayley, 
I I will also never get that image out of my head now. Dewey being the Maribs of hippos because of his very hairy, well furnished ears. I agree. Also, I think, you know, when we see hippos elsewhere, Treehouse Dam is honestly the best spot for us to view a hippo up close. You know, Chitwa Dam, they can get close, but the dam is massive, so oftentimes they're a little bit further off. Twin Dams is a bit shallow for hippos at the moment, and Gauri Dam as well is much larger than, than Treehouse Dam, so here we get really nice up close views of Dewey. And I think that also makes all the difference in the world, because we could see a lot more detail. I'd love to see, I've never seen a hippo close enough that you can see how thick the hairs are or, or kind of feel them. You know, I've been very lucky to, throughout the, the years in the bush, I've, I've worked with some different conservation projects and, you know, darting animals and things like that. And so I've been very lucky to, you know, feel the coats of some animals and um, feel an elephant's tail hair and see how thick it is. I'd love to be able to do that with the hippo because they don't have altogether that much hair on the body. It just seems to be the ears. But they look like they're quite thick. I think it is deceiving though because of the water. The water makes them clump together. But I'd love to actually see it up close at some point. If there's ever the need to dart a hippo anywhere in the low felt, please let me know whoever's doing it. I'd love to come and, and participate. I think he likes the attention on his ears. <laughs> He's angling them towards us to see that nice pink skin. Oh, and the pink nostrils. That was cute, a little pop up out of the water. I suppose he does need to breathe. Can't just listen and survive like that. I wonder if he enjoys the dawn chorus like we do. I wonder if animals perceive that the same way. I don't think they perceive it quite the same way, but I also don't think they dislike it because that's the normal sound of the bush. I suppose it would be a little weird if it was disrupted because then something's amiss. There might be a predator or something, you know? But if I was dewy, I would spend all day just with my ears popped out. When I'm not sunbathing, I'd be ears popped out of the water just listening to the calls. Have a listen. Now we've sparked a conversation about hippo hair. Jerome, no. I don't think you'll get a species of hippo that is any hairier than this particular hippo. The only other species we get is the pygmy hippo, which you won't even find here. You find it in the foresty sections. I've never ever seen one. I would love to see one. I've seen it in a zoo once. Uh, while I was in the UK, actually, I went to Whipsnade Zoo and they had pygmy hippos there, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was that zoo. And um, they look just like these, but the miniature version, so I don't think they're any hairier. They don't really need to be. With the aquatic lifestyle, the hair wouldn't really benefit anything. It would take too long to dry if they needed to warm up out of the water, and it would make them less streamlined as well. That's why most swimmers, professional swimmers especially. <laughs> Hello, you. <laughs> Good morning. I love that sound. Most professional swimmers, Jerome, will, will get rid of body hair. And it's exactly the same in the animal world. They don't need hair. They need something smoother than that to make them streamlined. But I will best believe I will be comparing a normal hippo's ears with a pygmy hippo's ears when I get home. I'm going to look at pictures and compare their ears because that seems to be quite important to them. They also have these really bristly hairs on the tips of their tails. Maybe he'll spoil us and, and go to the bathroom just now and we'll see that tail flicking. 
They have very spiny looking hairs, very similar to an elephant's hairs, right on the tip of the tail. Hello. Some nice conversations happening on the radio. I'm going to turn that all the way down. I prefer the bird calls. Lisa, that is a very good point. Hippos have a very unique call. I'd never really thought of that. The only thing that, that you can sometimes confuse it with, in fact, is a lion, believe it or not. At a very far distance, if there's hippos calling, it kind of distorts the sound a bit by the time it gets to you over a good few kilometers, and it sounds similar to lions. So both of them kind of distort to the same or a similar sound. Oh, that crested bob, it nearly whacked straight into us. That booming deep call. So I know bird calls are pretty popular. I'll go through all the different bird calls just now. I don't think I got that entire question. My my comms broke up there, Eagle. Did you hear it all? Harold wants to know if ticks get oxygen from the blood they suck if they're underwater. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Thank you for repeating it as well, Jared. <laughs> Harold, that is probably one of the most interesting questions I have heard. So the ticks will be able to get a little bit of everything from the blood underwater, but they they also don't necessarily need to need to breathe. They are capable of holding oxygen bubbles on the exoskeleton. But I'd imagine I mean, think about the way a tick functions. It pretty much buries its entire head into an animal. So I would imagine it wouldn't really, it wouldn't really need, need much oxygen. But I'm definitely going to look a little bit more into that because I'd never actually thought of that. Had you ever thought of that, Eagle? No? I'd never thought of that before. Amazing. You learn something new every day that you, you've really literally never even, it's never crossed my mind how ticks would get oxygen underwater with hippos. Oh, Egyptian geese flying over. And having a call. That's just fantastic. I can't wait to just listen to the bird calls. This pair is being very vocal, as Egyptian geese are. They're communicating with each other, but also letting other Egyptian geese know this territory is very much taken. Oh, that was close. The lapwing is getting incredibly defensive of that area where they normally nest. I wonder if they're not setting up camp for another nest.
Just that lapwing holding its ground made the geese completely change direction. They did a U-turn. The most courageous bird eagle. I would think lapwings are definitely up there, but overall I would think a fork-tailed drongo. They're just so tenacious. Attacking raptors, mobbing, and so intelligent as well. Incredible mimics. Fork-tailed drongos are high up there on the list of brave, brave birds, I suppose you could call them. <laughs> but I don't think I'd ever want to walk up to a lapwing nest either. <laughs> they are very protective, which is incredible in the bird world especially. Just take a look at what you got there, if it will work. Let me check that. Try and zoom in a bit more. That's a bit too much. We can try. <laughs> Not really sure what happened there, but Chris, hi, I miss you. <laughs> it's so lovely to have Chris out and about. Now on this side, not much has changed. Myself and Igor are starting to warm up nicely. Our backs to the sun, Igor and I. Myself and Igor, you and I. And I'm sure Dewey is doing the same. He's bringing his back out the water. We're hoping that more and more animals start doing this from now because sitting still, the breeze is still there. It's chilly. But if you can position your body with a lot of surface area to the sun, it's warming up fast. It is wonderful. But I want to go through some of the bird calls that we can hear around us. I'll uh, keep quiet for a little bit so we can hear a variety and then we can talk through some of them. Okay, that one was obviously an Egyptian goose. <laughs> So an absolutely brilliant variety of bird calls from the red-billed buffalo weavers to Franklins and Spurfowls, one calling in front, one calling behind. But choo, 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 choo. That's the red-billed buffalo weaver. We've also heard a Steerling's wren warbler. It sounds like a telephone ringing. That one in the background. I don't know if you can hear it. It's like a mixture of a very high-pitched car alarm and a telephone, old-school telephone ringing. If you can't hear it, I'm going to softly play the call for you because it is beautifully unusual. We've also heard black-crowned chagras, tawny-flanked prinias. There's a the red-billed buffalo weaver again. We heard a woodpecker tapping away just now, but I haven't heard it pretty much since we arrived, almost. 
but even cystic colors. There's just so many bird calls around us today. I'm just waiting for my bird calls to open. <laughs> it's having a slow morning. That's okay. We have time and sunshine. Time and sunshine. Okay, while I wait for that to start working so I can share some of those bird calls with you, we found Chris. We got him back, so I'll send you there. So like I mentioned earlier, war trolls doesn't necessarily mean big bodies of water. This time of the year, it's very important to check these wallows. And as you can see, this is a tiny little wallow. And the reason why it's important specifically for tracking is that the surrounding soil is quite hard after the rain. So it's difficult to see the imprint of a cat, but closer to these little wallows where there's fine, fine, very soft mud. And we can clearly see some leopard tracks here. This is very fresh tracks of a female leopard. Actually see them coming in from this side and then it stopped here to drink. Even slipped there a bit and then it drank there. So nothing's wallowed here recently. So what happens then, the water which is stationary, all the clay and sand particles sinks down to the bottom making this quite drinkable. But the moment a buffalo comes in here and wallows or a warthog or even elephants, it's slush, it's mud again. But usually early mornings and during the night, they don't wallow. It's usually later in the day, making this a very efficient little pit stop for something like a leopard that doesn't need to divert far away to go to the bigger dams. It can quickly get some hydration here and then move on. All right, so we want to try and figure out who this leopard is. Uh, there's not enough detail in the track from here to say for sure who it is and the only leopardess I can positively identify by track is the pixie pan female since she's got that very characteristic crack in one of her pads but it looks like a female leopard Janet Planet wants to know if it's possible to track leopards in the rain. It's near possible while it's raining because the moment they've got that track, especially if it's hard torrential rain, it will quickly kill that track. Um, so, and if they are active during the rain, it can be true. If it's directly after the rain, then you will see tracks as clearly as this. But if it's a couple of hours after the rain, when the soil starts binding, then seeing an imprint is very, very tricky. You have to look at things like grass, that are stepped flat, but it's difficult with cats because they don't walk like that. They won't walk over the grass, they'll rather choose a pathway through the grass. So it becomes tricky, but you can look at little grass leaves that are bent forward. It's almost like they point towards where the animal has moved. So these wallows are created in several ways. Natural small depressions fill up with a bit of clay, buffalo and war talk starts wallowing, as they wallow, they remove matter in the form of clay and sand out of it as it sticks to their bodies. Next time it fills up, it erodes, it becomes bigger, 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 bigger. And over decades and millennia, this will actually become bigger and bigger and bigger eventually. Some not. Some will eventually get a flash flood and it will cover up again. But these are vital. Uh, Emily Lee wants <laughs> to mention that New Year's resolution is to see Chris mud wallowing. Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a challenge, but uh, I'm not so sure about that one. I'm not so sure about that one. I'll have to, I'll have to be convinced somehow. I know there's a few of my colleagues that are eager to do things like that, <laughs> but uh, 
Let's see if we can get a day. I'll make you a deal. If we can get a day where it's 45 degrees Celsius, I'll not wallow. Anyway, let's head over to Tyler, who's on a bumble. It might have to be about 50 degrees Celsius for me to mud wallow. <laughs> um, we have, gosh, we've been everywhere so far this morning. Just trying to figure out where on earth those dogs went, but I, I don't know. I don't know where they've gone now. Uh, so I'm back up on quarantine and kind of just giving the dogs a rest. I am, what I am going to do though, is there were male leopard tracks that took just literally up ahead of us. So I want to have a look at them and see where they go. I, I suspect that they, when I was following them for a little bit, I mean, I was just driving in that direction. I wasn't really trying to find the leopard. I was just focusing on the on the dogs. I think it went towards uh, Ingwe Alley, unless I actually went off onto the other side and went towards Rebecca's. But if Tess was down a tree house and she didn't pick up anything, then more likely there could be a chance that the leopard is still here. So I just want to see if we can see the tracks and then I will show you. Mm, there's some nice ones. Sorry, I'm just looking for the, the nicest set of tracks. But there's been, obviously been a couple of vehicles that have driven here now. Where are you? Maybe they've all been driven over now. That's a possibility. Oh no. Let me just jump off quickly. Come around. Okay, in the road that we find barely any tracks on is normally um, uh, is normally the, the hardest road <laughs> then you can't really see much at uh, much at all um, I'm trying to think which is a really difficult road to track on anyway Ali's not the easiest sorry I just need to just turn the game drive radio off for two seconds um, uh, what else? I'm trying to think what's really really hard which for the most part with Juma there are sandy sections on the road and then you'll get to places where there's a bit of rocks and uh, and, you know and the ground is so compacted and it's tricky uh, especially like the last no I don't really know off the top of my head anyways uh, so these male leopard tracks has definitely been quite a few vehicles that have driven over them now I'm just trying to find a nice one um, what's quite interesting though is this, this leopard was definitely moving quite quickly and this track is actually quite deceiving we're going to look at this one over here because if you look at it immediately you could think uh, it's slightly angled and you can actually see a claw mark over here and a claw mark over here on the two outside toes and you probably go oh it's hyena but it not it's actually it's just a big male leopard that has been marching along and you can even see how the toes have pushed forward slightly um in the track too so here right at the back you can still see the three lobes and and then like i said the claws have shown a little bit but that could happen especially when you're moving downhill and then if we go to this track over here and you see look how even more disturbed it is and look how the toes look almost elongated how it's obviously picked he, he has picked his foot up and moved it quite quickly and here but here's a much better example of a big leopard track and you can just kind of keep following them but this individual is moving quite quickly marching marching on didn't really see where you know this this male leopard may be marked I'm not sure if one of the leopards also because I'm just looking in all the tracks and it seems like what foot is that it looks like it's a, a, a back back left foot I don't know if there's something wrong with the toes and the claws maybe show out but there's actually lots of you can see the claw marks all the way here so the leopard was just moving quite quickly so this is where the tracks sort of fade away the ground becomes a little bit more compacted so now it's like okay where where did he actually go but there's been so many different cars 
that have driven around here it's a little bit on the tricky side to see here they've been completely flattened but then I can pick them up again over here and then this is kind of where I started to to lose them oh Jason that's quite a good question have I ever misidentified a track and then it resulted in a surprise I've misidentified so many tracks in my life I think it's not I think I know I still misidentify tracks um I haven't really come across not not a surprise where I've gone oh you know these are hyena tracks for an example and then stumbled across wild dogs I, I can't think off the top of my head if I've had any moments like that um I did it live once it was quite funny um I was, oh here we go, sorry I'm obviously trying to concentrate and just make sure that I can still see tracks, they're still going down here, so that's cool, we'll just drive a bit further. Um, what had happened, oh I was just outside at camp and there were so many cat tracks, they were everywhere and I was like what is going on, it must be lions, it must be lions, I was like this is crazy, maybe it's a female because it was what I could see. I was like, maybe it's a female lion, like a, a female lioness, obviously, a lioness. And with, you know, some sub adults or whatever, it was Karula, Shongile, Hosanna had walked there, and Tingana. And then it took me a moment, and then I was saying this, and then I think I corrected myself, and I was like, I don't know why I said there were lion tracks there. Clearly leopard tracks. So, you know, it happened, it literally happens to the best of us. We overthink things. Let's just go a bit further down the road. So I just mark the tracks there just so that if I do lose them again I can just take a few steps back, reset myself and, and just make sure I, I know where, where the tracks are going. So ideally, when because so many people have driven here now, this is something that you'll do on foot. And my priority this morning was initially not focusing on finding a leopard, it was looking for for the dogs so I didn't pay too much attention to them obviously now I'm coming back because my first uh, bit failed so here oh gosh it's gonna look like there's absolutely nothing but because cars have kind of driven here but there's some toes that I can see and I know that the leopard was still walking in this direction so slowly starting here's another one these are just partial tracks now and this is where it becomes difficult. So here it becomes a little bit harder. The ground is quite compacted. But as long as if a leopard or a lion or whatever you're tracking kind of stays on the, the outside and walks on the softer sand that's constantly being turned up, then it makes it a little bit easier. Um, so now I don't have, I haven't got any obvious tracks. So I'll go and reset myself again and just, you know, yes, try and figure this out. So that's exactly what I'm going to do.
So the hyena den has definitely overgrown quite a lot and this is not a bad thing this is fantastic because the rain has obviously encouraged so much fresh growth what it does mean though is it makes it extra challenging for us to get even a basic view of the termite mound itself so through all of that greenery there is in fact a termite mound i know it doesn't seem like it but there is one there and this is where somebody had a mother and cub suckling last week However, we don't know who it was. We did not get lucky enough to see them. At the moment, it doesn't seem like there's any activity, but the main entrance to the den is very much still in the shade. It's on the right-hand side. Very much still in the shade. It's on the western side of the termite mound, which means it's going to be chilly in that entrance. The warmest place for cubs to be is going to be safely tucked away underneath. Thank you, patience. Where the adults are probably still off on an adventure somewhere, maybe having a nap somewhere. I don't know. Can you see anything, Eagle, with the camera? No. I'm not seeing any movement at the den. But what I am hoping is that maybe if we go down, I know Taylor's done quite a bit of the Milawati, so she would have spotted any hyenas if they were there. Um, but I do want to quickly go and check Twin Dams, just to make sure that maybe my timber and spirit and ribbon aren't around. I am very pleased that uh, I sent some screenshots of spirit. Because when last I saw my timber and spirit, spirit wasn't looking amazing and we were kind of wondering what might be going on. We chatted to Kim Voliter and a few other hyena specialists and they said no, they don't think it's mange. Hyenas don't really get mange, they've got such strong immune systems that they can work through things like anthrax, sometimes even rabies. And so they don't really get mange. But they'd never certainly heard of, of mange and hyenas. But they thought maybe a lot of competition and interaction between the different clan members because of course they are very low ranking cubs, they are ribbons cubs. But when I was sent screenshots while I was on leave, Spirit doesn't have a mark left on the body in terms of patches of hair loss or anything that looked like a bunch of scabs and scars. And so it looks like Spirit is in much better condition from the photos anyway that I saw. But I would love to actually see him again and see him with my own eyes because also I think it can look different with the naked eye to how it looks maybe on camera. You know, the angles aren't quite the same and you're not always getting an overall view. So to spend time with him would be absolutely brilliant. It would make my day. But unfortunately, not yet. The hyenas are making me wait a little longer. That's okay though. I like it when when you're in the right place at the right time and animals choose to come to you or make themselves known. It's a very important thing. I don't think uh, I don't think it's something that we get to express fairly often, but you know, wildlife, we are lucky here. We've got fairly habituated, in fact incredibly habituated wildlife. But a lot of the time for an animal just to show you that it is there is a massive deal, particularly different species, things like cheetahs are quite shy, leopards with cubs are quite shy, so we are exceptionally lucky in this area with that. But I mean, if you go to the Eastern Cape, <laughs> there are leopards there, there are tracks, you'll find carcasses of animals that they've killed, do you think that they show themselves? Nope, they don't. You'll hear of a flash of one on a camera trap somewhere but they're there and there's lots of them but they won't show themselves so just the honor of having an animal make itself known is is incredible in any wild environment okay let's see what twin dams has to offer water hole water hole and lots of mud wallows around. I will not be contributing to the temperature scale on what it would take for me to mud wallow. Not right now. It's too early for that conversation. I need more coffee. <laughs> but I'm sure Cedric will oblige when he gets back. Okay, so I can see Twin Dams. Amazing. Twin Dams is here. It hasn't moved. Good news good news. I can also see some more Egyptian geese. I can, ooh, barn swallows flying over occasionally. 
That's good. Ooh. Oh, well done, Igor. Monitor lizard. on that monitor. The tail is so red, but the head has still got that beautiful, vibrant, vibrant yellow. Very distinctive of water monitors as opposed to rock monitors. They don't really have as much yellow and that streaking down the body. This is a fairly large one. I don't think it's the biggest one we've seen at Twin Dams, but it's a very decent size. Those Egyptian geese are making a noise. James, as far as I am aware, yes, all monitor lizard species are cold blooded. Um, <laughs> to be honest, I'm not really sure if that's a trick question or not because reptiles are by nature cold blooded and lizards are reptiles but I mean there's always an exception to the rule right so maybe there'll be maybe there'll be one somewhere in the world that isn't and and it's it's tricking me <laughs> but as far as I know yes all reptiles are cold-blooded and they will enjoy basking in the sun like this on a sunny day after some days of rain so I'm very happy that that's at least our first reptile for the morning I'm hoping that we get lucky with a few more. I'd really like to see a snake this morning. But maybe this afternoon would be better for snakes, a little bit hotter. I've just noticed a female knob-billed duck. Sorry, I'm going to draw your attention away from the monitor lizard, purely because I think it's still going to be there for a while. It's going to be mud basking. I mean, mud sun sunbathing, mud basking. That was great. But down in the little pan systems, there's a female knob-billed duck. It's been a while since I've seen one of those. We've seen that male quite regularly now at Triast Dam, although he wasn't there this morning. This female looks absolutely stunning, especially when she turns her head like that into the sun. She's got such striking markings on her face and neck. Look at this fantastic, fantastic, beautiful purple lilac flower. Very common plant out here. And I thought today, while looking for animals, we'll definitely look at some standouts at this time of the year. As we all know, it's the rainy season, all sorts of flowering plants at the moment. And just look at this. This is, for me, one of the true standouts of the African bush. This is if we look at the bark here, it's very easy to identify the tree. It's got this sort of ashy complex to it, sort of like a very pale complex, other than the flowers. Look at these very sort of, look at the leaves. I'm not sure if panda can go there. So it's got a, a pinnately compound leaf, as you can see there. This is the actual whole leaf. I'm not going to break it. You can see the, the bud there. So that whole structure there is the leaf with its leaflets. And that is a pinnately compound leaf and very lancelet shape, sort of very thin and long lance like shape. And the underside very, very pale. But the key characteristic, it's a small shrub. And if you look at the bark here, Ben can just bring it. I'm just gonna break it a bit. And you can actually see how it flakes off into small pieces of cork. Right. Or something that resembles cork. So this is the cork bush, Mindulia sericea. And this is a very important plant culturally. It contains a whole bunch of toxins, one of them being rotenones or rotenone, or also rotenoids, which includes a whole bunch of other substances. And rotenone is used to poison fish. So it's used traditionally 
to poison fish to consume. And the beautiful thing about rotenone is it doesn't absorb into the actual body of the fish. Even though it's a toxin that is toxic to us to a certain degree, but it attaches to the gills of the fish and it inhibits its oxygen take up. And therefore, they will be edible if you do catch them in that way. We picked up on those leopard tracks again. So they basically crossed just before Fulamon's dip and then went onto Rebecca's road. And now we've still got them. We kind of should pop out near the Bella Nighty's junction if he carries on walking through here. But the uh, this looks like a little bit more like it's it's a couple of hours old now these tracks. They're not they're not steaming, you know. So I'm just checking up in the trees as well because the wild dogs obviously came around here yesterday afternoon when we you know sort of left them when we well I know where they we left them but they were, had chased a lot of impala around and there were lots of young lambs by themselves so you know while he was walking through here whoever it might be I could have very very easily snapped up one of those little impala so I'm just you know sort of taking it easy not driving very quickly at all now I'm too busy talking so I didn't see where the tracks went but luckily this is a very sandy intersection and they go that way back towards Weatella access haha -ha, interesting let us just double check that we're going in the right way yup okay so now they come come down this way crazy how much leopards can just walk and turn on a dime just when you think you have an idea of where they're going to go obviously it's a little bit more difficult for me because I have don't spend enough time here and I haven't quite worked out you know the favorite routes of Mulwati or what does tortoise pan do when he comes through and obviously you chat to the other guides and it's and you get you have an understanding but it becomes much easier when you know their exact routes, their favorite pathways, their favorite termite mounds, what their habits are. I also don't know what tortoise pan and Molwati like to do. Um, so that makes it a little bit more tricky. But the tracks are still going along here. And I'm curious now, because Tess drove Zoe's road, so I don't know I don't know where these tracks are gonna end up popping up, but I'm I'm assuming we're gonna intercept roads at some point again too much too much talking and then I don't concentrate and because some someone else has also driven here again run in the same into the same problem that I had earlier but they were very much still marching down the road. But again, at any point they can turn off, they can hear something. Let's just carry on a bit. Maybe we'll get to another very, very sandy patch. My Mrs. Wiggs fan. Oh gosh, you know, there's so there's so much advice that you can you can give one, but for, for those young enthusiasts wanting to learn a little bit about tracking uh, practice 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 track your dogs dogs are probably a bit easier to track than trying to track a domestic cat because they're so light and their footprints are really tiny and quite often unless you have got a you know the most perfect substrate you're not going to really see their footprints at all so start off with something easier i was actually talking about this the other day and i said you know if you don't have a dog to track you know find a friend and wear a particular type of shoes that's got a very obvious track or even go barefoot and stamp the ground a bit make it a bit easier so your eye can sort of get into it and it sounds a bit ridiculous but it's just amazing how you can still look on the road and this of course comes with a bit of time and a bit of experience it, ah, Oh, hang on, we'll take, there's a hyena. Hello, hyena, don't turn off the road, don't do that. Okay, let's see if it comes around. It's just turned off the road, obviously. There is a hyena prancing down here. Where are you gonna lead us? Are you going to maybe lead us to a leopard? They've been very busy, the hyenas. So, so yeah, so don't, don't, don't start off with something too difficult. Like, don't say to yourself, right, I'm going to go and track a daycare. 
common daycare because that's like ridiculous and that's a, yeah, uh, very uh, now of course it's stopped can you see it is it gone Oh, it's, gosh, it's moved. Unfortunately, it's moved off so quickly. I thought it was just going to carry on down the road, but it's not. Yay! So much fun. Okay, anyways. So, yeah, do that. Track people. I don't know who the hyena was. It was such a quick sighting. And then three, four, five. Starting on more and more turns. Taking more and more turns to start. Anyways, uh... Yeah, so I don't I don't actually have the leopard tracks anymore. I think maybe it, this individual might have cut off and gone elsewhere. Oh no, I do, I lie, I have them. I still have someone's just driven over them, sort of partially. I wonder if it was ga um, Gangrika that we just saw. I mean, I say this and I feel like I know the hyenas incredibly well, I don't. It's just quite a pale hyena but and looked quite you know short not massive just yet um but not not pale like swazi pale maybe it was maybe it was her anyways i'm going to send you all the way back down i say all the way it's probably less than a kilometer as the crow flies to tess who's still down in the southern parts of juma tracks again a little reset that definitely worked good luck taylor also i'd love to know which hyena that was and where you are <laughs> just out of interest because i'm sure you all know i'm very invested in the clan okay so we're still at twin dams and the noble duck has left us but the monitor lizard is definitely still having a great time sunning itself and i promised you that i would play you a few of the bird calls that we were hearing at trias dam because i know it wasn't very clear because they were a little bit soft in the background so the first is the stearlings wren warbler it's probably one of the more unusual sounds so that's that kind of mix between between almost a telephone and an alarm. It's it's a strange sound, but very distinctive in the bush. And then the other one that I wanted to play, which is, I suppose, almost similar, is the tawny flanked prinia, because we could also hear that in the background, but very soft. So that's like a very tiny little shy, high-pitched hiccup. And those are two of the more unusual ones that we heard at the dam. They are both tiny, tiny birds. You can hear it just from the tone of the call. It's a very high-pitched call from the frequency. And then the other, which is one of my absolute favorites, because we could hear it quite a bit at the dam, is a <clears throat> black crown chagra. It sounds like it's having a conversation with itself. Those are probably some of my favorites from from Treehouse Dam this morning. You will hear a vehicle coming past us. It is in fact Peter. <laughs> We're looking at a monitor lizard. <laughs> so Peter was absolutely brilliant last night. He graced us with his presence for the Inkanyeni fireside chat and what a perfect person to do it because she was his favorite leopardess <laughs> and he is such a character it's always good to see him out on the reserve so here I can hear woodland kingfishers more than anything can hear hornbills far in the distance. I wouldn't mind hearing a southern ground hornbill now. Ooh. Doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> Very good attempt, Eagle. Very good. And it's amazing. Water holes in particular just have that draw card to them, the draw factor. 
whether you're a rock monitor or water monitor, a bird, a fish. It's just incredible. Water really is life out here. Brian, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a bird that would use tracks to find prey. Any of the raptors? I wouldn't really think so. They use movement and sound, absolutely. They sit perched high up in the trees and they they watch for movement. Did you spot the hornbill? <laughs> Had a kill. <laughs> so they sit perched up and they look for movement and listen for sounds and that's really how those horn hornbills, wow, those raptors will find small things to eat. I don't think I've ever seen any form of raptor using tracks to find small prey. I don't think it would really be worth it because small prey move so fast and can move so far and hide so well that it's much easier to just look for the movement because then at least you know where that animal is, you've seen movement. As opposed to tracking would, I mean you've seen us track, let's use that as an example. You've seen us track and how much energy and time goes into that process. You have to look for tracks, you have to try and predict where it's going to go, identify what species it is and decide whether it's worth tracking. Imagine if a bird had to do that every single time it was hunting. Or even a, a leopard, really, if they had to do that every single time they were hunting, physically look for a track, track the animal, it might be five hours ahead of you. It would be very difficult for, for animals to find prey that way. They certainly can follow each other around with those scent trails that are left behind, but this is more common in, in the same species looking for another member of the same species rather than predator-prey interactions, if that makes sense. There's a lot of energy that goes into it and it would be very much wasted because tracking efforts are not, not always successful. Where picking up movement is much more likely to be successful because you know there is something there and if you're patient, you'll probably get it. So that uses a lot less energy. Igor, the glare is very bad. I can't see what's on the screen. <laughs> okay, a hornbill just got an insect. Thank you. <laughs> we are with our backs to the sun. Oh, there we go. I see it's flown off the damn wall. We're with our backs to the sun, but that also means the screens are to the sun. So <laughs> we can't see an awful lot at this angle. <laughs> <laughs> it's a guessing game. <laughs> Woo! Oh, it's back. Hello, hornbill. Southern yellow billed hornbill. Now, of course, birds will love the water holes this time of the year because they attract insects. Insects attract birds and actually a whole lot of other animals, jackals and things too. Smaller predators, larger predators, all the herbivores are attracted to water. But for birds in particular, there will be a wealth of insects living in this area, not necessarily for the water, but for what the water has brought to this particular area. Is that a yellow bull hornbill? Is the sun that bad that I can't even see if it's yellow or red? That's red. That's so funny. Hey, he's trotting over. Hello. It's a southern red bull hornbill. That is ridiculously funny. That's how bad the glare is today that I can't even see yellow versus red. <laughs> now that you're coming closer, I can see you very nicely. You're beautiful. But essentially the wealth of life that a waterhole attracts is really one of the best reasons why you should spend time with them, especially, especially if you're an avid entomologist or a birder, an ornithologist or a twitcher. Adding to the bird list. How many birds are you on now, Igor? 86. 86. Sure, we've done well. You want to hit 100 birds this week. That is awesome. That is a great challenge. I accept it. So this hornbill is busy hopping around. The impalas, there's impalas running past. They've just noticed us, but they're not sticking around. I was just about to ask Igor to show you, but they have disappeared so fast. I think the wind is making them nervous. But let's see what the hornbill does. Maybe it's about to oh, catch an insect. Oh, it's come to land right next to us. That's fancy. Thank you, hornbill. I can 
see how it's looking. It's almost craning its neck. So it's looking for any movement on these leaves. And you'll probably find it's looking for either mantids or stick insects or grasshoppers, something like that. All of those green insects that camouflage so well amongst the leaves. They use it as protection, but the hornbill's eyes are so good. They can see the movement of an ant on those leaves. All right, it's hiding at the moment, but let's see if it comes back out. Hopefully the patience game pays off and we see it with a kill. Weekend at the Waterhole is backed by popular demand. After all the excitement of the family-filled festive season, what better way to relax and unwind than reclined at the edge of an African waterhole? Come and get your nature fix all day on the 7th and 8th of January. See you there. Right, we're just close to Leopard Dam, which is just below us here. And we're just doing a wide circle around Leopard Dam looking for tracks. And these little open burnt areas are usually a good place to look for tracks. And you can even see here, if I go down, even if I step here, you know, with the ash and everything, it creates a different texture to the soil. It gets a bit of moisture, it swells out. And so if you can, you can clearly see and even a cat that would walk here, you'll get a, a nice little imprint of a cat's foot if they walk over this. This ash and clay that's kind of like mixed. But at the moment, nothing on this little patch. I even checked the drainage. Oh, drainage, it's a little depression. I always talk about drainages. These drainages are, are little, I wouldn't say streams, it's like little seasonal little gullies that can flow seasonally after rain. So when you talk about a drainage line, that is what we're referring to. And they eventually meet up and form bigger rivers or subterranean rivers. Anyway, look at this tree that's burnt. It's obviously dead. Can't really see which species it is. Looking at the bark here, that's also quite charred. It's quite difficult, but it kind of like Looks like it can be a weeping wattle, but I can't say for certain. It's quite hard. You can see how the outside, when it got burned, it creates little blocks of coal. 
and we can use this. Now remember earlier we spoke about the toxins that we can find in certain plants. We had that cork, cork bush, lots of toxins. There's a whole bunch of toxic fruits. So if you're out here in the bush and you might have eaten something that's either toxic or perhaps uh, laced with some bacteria, this is medicine you can use. So you can take a lot of this, as much of the charcoal that you can get and try and get the perfectly black bits. If you do have access to water, just put it in your cup, grind it up, quite a bit of it, crush it with a stone into the water, but you need to get it as fine as possible so you can basically consume it and drink that with water. And we know it is essentially vegetable carbon and that will absorb toxins in the stomach. So if you have eaten something toxic, this is the first thing that you will need to ingest. Just look at all these flakes of carbon coming out. Charcoal, essentially. Here's a nice little piece that one can use. Something like this will be great. Just bash it up into a, as much as close as you can get to a powder. Mix it with water and drink it. And that will definitely help, definitely help to absorb some toxins. Yeah, it's not the reason we stopped here, I just noted this while looking for some tracks here. Alright, let's uh, head over to Leopard Dam and see if we can't find anything there. Right, stay with us. I'm just going to get onto the car. Whew. Okay, it's a bit quiet this morning. I was expecting a bit more movement, considering now we've got, you know, much better weather. Well, what we perceive as good weather. And uh, there's been a few reports of elephants, but it doesn't seem like a lot of movement. And I'm not sure why that would be. Let's go and check at the dam. Maybe we get some luck there. But I do suspect leopard dam is going to become less and less and less active in terms of wildlife because it's becoming more of a muddy pool now. Up until such time that we can expect some good rain. Like proper downpour. I mean, there's two drainages. And we spoke about the drainages or depressions. Almost like little mini streams, erosion streams. So we're on an elevated area and it goes down into the drainage line and then it elevates again. So all the rain funnels down initially onto the drainage line. These drainage lines meet up eventually into rivers. But in the case of Leopard Dam, you've got two drainages meeting up just before it enters the dam and then it enters the dam. And that's so the the way the dam fills up is not the rain, it physically falls on top of the dam. It's actually further, if I can say, upstream, where we are now, higher up. That drains into drainage lines, the drainage lines feeds the dam. Gosh, I hope you find all sorts of wonderful things at Leopard Dam. Wowza, we've finally been able to come to a stop because we've just been driving around looking for, you know, tracks and following things. We've stumbled across this elephant. I am going to keep my distance from him um, just because we are in Sparky. But he's very relaxed at the moment and is just sort of munching away. But before I get into elephant saga, I just want to give you a quick update on the leopard tracks. I don't know if I picked up on, on a different male leopard tracks, but I, when I popped out onto Voyatella Access, there was another male, or I don't, I don't know if it was the same individual, sort of going down towards the, uh, towards the main gate, so in more of a westerly direction. And then they turned 
just before Sandy Patch turned off and kind of went in more of a northwesterly direction. So to me, that seems like maybe that was Tortoise Pan because that seems to be his favorite hangouts. And I drove around and I did a loop and I couldn't see any more tracks. So he might be in the block, but I, I basically just turned onto Aubrey's road to go back south and we bumped into this elephant. So, you know, the saga still continues as to who and what and where and how the leopards of Juma Ah, oh, and anyways, um, but a lovely, lovely elephant bull. Not very old. He actually looks like he's still got quite a bit of growing to do. He's very awkward. His his rump, you can see the bone um, that goes just over the top of his spinal. His his spinal. Why can't I English? His back, you can see, is much higher than the front of his head, um, and. He almost looks like his head is like too little for his body. So I think he's going to at some point have another growth spurt again. And he's not particularly stocky. He's a tall elephant, but hasn't filled out, uh, you know, for what we normally see of, of bulls that are well over 30 entering their 40s. You know, they're normally, uh, you know, beautiful individuals. So I think he's probably in his early 30s, this fella, or, or very late 20s. But like I said, doesn't look particularly old, doesn't have sunken temples or anything like that. Sometimes, not sometimes, when elephants start to get older, their skin becomes a, a lot more sort of saggy and um, to sort of get that gaunt look. But he doesn't have that at all. He's still a young boy. But not even stopping. He's just munching away on grass in between all of the silver cluster leaves. Like I said, I'm, I would love to try and reposition, but then I get a bit too close to him. And if I do need to reverse, I don't think that I will though. That's not what his behavior is showing us at the moment. Uh, I don't want to get myself into a bit of a pickle. So we'll just sort of stay, stay at this distance. And I'm not joking when I say that there are only two, I'm gonna see if, my ha if I can reach. Ah, I want to show you. So there's this silver cluster leaf, and then there's another one, just a little bit behind it and these are young silver cluster leaf trees and look at how that elephant has completely disappeared now there really isn't much foliage and if you look towards where his trunk is it's almost it's difficult to see just every now and then you see some movement but his tusks actually look like a branch so you really have to have your wits about you when when you are on foot and moving around and even while you're driving because you know how many times we come around the corner and you don't see an elephant it's a uh, it's quite impressive and then you're, well, you're right on top of them when you sort of get there. He's got something, I'm trying to see what he's got dangling in his mouth. I think he was also eating, oh he's just dropped it now. Um, he had a piece of bark in his mouth too, eating everything all at once. It's a pity, I think the wind might be blowing just a bit too much to hear how he pulls out the blades of grass. He's going to disappear soon. Johnny, yes, albino elephants do exist. However, they don't normally uh, survive. You know, when you're, when you're that color and you, and you are in Africa and you're an elephant, that must be very, very unpleasant. You really are going to be susceptible to sunburn. I mean, it doesn't really matter how much you cover your um, cover yourself with mud. I'm just watching this, Ellie. He's just kind of just sneaking past the car. You should see him pop out now. Hello, big boy. Hey, big fella. He's so tall. But like I said, his head doesn't really match his body. It's starting to fall out quite nicely. Hi, big boy. And he's not even interested in us at all. He hasn't turned his trunk to us. There we go. There, did you see that little side swipe? How I, you might have just caught it. He turned his trunk a little bit towards us. Just be like, oh, hey, there you are. And off he goes. Not worried about us at all so yeah so um, albino elephants not made to survive uh i'm trying to think why do i think that there was one that was born somewhere i forget anyways we see leucistic elephants quite often though where you'll see they might have a slightly lighter eye and sort of blonde on the lashes and blonde on the tail hair maybe a little bit of pigmentation but but i've never i've never i don't think i've ever seen an albino elephant before
And that's obviously when you have albino, that's a complete reduction in melanin and then, you know, they're much lighter. Goodness, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't like that. Actually, when I was in Tanzania this year, uh, last year, I have to forget we were in a new year, in Tarangiri National Park, we had to try to have a look for him. There was an albino African buffalo. How cool is that? Uh, and, and an adult, not even a baby. So quite often we'll see el el when sightings are reported of albino animals, especially in the wild, like, you know, in Africa, they'll normally be young. However, this was a fully grown buffalo bull, completely albino, Un unbelievable. But we didn't find him. Uh, so I would have been crazy to see, but he stood out like a sore thumb. I would have just literally lived in the water. I would have turned into like, you know, a water buffalo literally and just submerged myself the whole time. Because it can't be nice. It can't be nice at all. I know how I feel when I don't put sunscreen on. And at least I can apply sunscreen. Of course they've got the mud, but not even a buffalo obviously finds it a bit difficult because they're not like an elephant that can at least reach all the hard to uh, get places with their trunk and trunkfuls of mud. Yeah, so just just before we found this elephant, I heard an, an update on the radio. It sounds like there were some lions that were on their way north from Arethusa. Not, they didn't have lions themselves, but they had lots of their tracks. So I'm going south down Aubrey's now. What I might do is, is sort of scan the southwestern corner and just and just see what's happening that side. Maybe the lions popped on. I'm also trying to figure out where the buffalo went. So just last night as we were coming back, because we obviously had to prepare for uh, fire chat we we stumbled across that big herd of buffalo they had moved and they were on the western corner of quarantine and the bulls were very unimpressed most of the herd was already sort of heading in the direction of Gallego pan and there were about eight bulls big bulls standing at the back looking into the tree line heads up sort of standing as tall as a buffalo could stand and yeah, that was, it was quite interesting. So I don't know if it was maybe lions or, or what kind of was in the area. Maybe they just got the scent of something, but they weren't very impressed and the herd was moving on. So haven't haven't seen, actually even seen the tracks of the buffalo. Another reason why I'm sort of zigzagging this area. Uh, but I have definitely not seen any lion tracks just yet. And I've driven most of uh, we had access towards Sandy Patch. So there is, of course, that one stretch that I, I could still check. But honestly, I think from here, I'm going to go all, you know, sort of just zigzag up and down, maybe along the power lines road down towards Triple M, and then maybe come back and see. No one reported tracks of the buffalo crossing out to the, the north, but also I could have missed that just because I, I, I can't hear very well on, on this handheld uh, radio. It can be a bit tricky sometimes. So I could have I could have missed that. And I only drove the eastern section of uh bubbles of cut line and then obviously quite a bit of cheetah cut line too so I, it always blows my mind how you can go from having every single animal the day before and then nothing a few hours later Good morning from Kariha, where it is going to be an absolute cooker of a day today. Just to introduce myself, I'm Nick. I'm going to be your photographic naturalist for today. And yeah, we're still continuing our uh, little waterhole madness on the weekend. And uh, yeah, I was just heading along towards Scotia Dam to see if anybody was around there. And along the way, I've come across this lovely scene here. Plenty of zebra, plenty of eland. And it looks like two ostriches right in the distance at the back there. White stork making a little appearance. Moving right at the back as well, left to right. And yeah, remember for for the whole of this weekend uh, across all the locations we're focusing on our waterholes so this is definitely the 
the type of weather that we want to to attract all of those animals down towards the water holes um, I would say that today it feels like at this time of the day it was it was hotter than yesterday um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens around the water holes if we start to get a whole lot of activity so Karika is obviously uh, a beautiful reserve you can see the thickets in the background there's lots of deep valleys lots of high ridges moving along the way this morning to to get towards this area I crested one of the the high ridges and was able to get a good sort of view of the whole of this um, this section where we are at the moment um, kind of looking down towards some of the thickets I heard of buffaloes I saw kind of resting in the in the shade ruminating a little bit there so that could have potentially been uh, one of the spots that they rested up for the evening so maybe they'll uh, make an appearance for us a little bit later but yeah we'll uh, later on head down towards Scotia Dam I mean that was our initial aim see if we can get some nice birds there maybe some herons either grey heron black headed heron some of the arbor species possibly You can see there's a few crows that are flying around as well. Chomi wise guys, first of all I like your name and uh, second of all, yeah, Karik is definitely producing the goods. Always something going on. Lots of diversity, easy on the eye. Yeah, and I think it's great that we can uh, bring all these very different types of uh, locations and obviously habitats and landscapes that go with them live to you guys. It's amazing. Think of the difference of, of looking from uh, sort of the waterhole at Okukuyo to here. I mean, it's completely different. So nice that we can bring that live to you. Yeah, you can really see in and amongst those earlunt and the zebra tails are all starting to flick lots of movement from ears as well so there's obviously lots of uh, lots of little flies and little hojas moving around already June, thanks for the question. Um, I haven't seen zebra fight, uh, zebra males fighting to the death before. Um, it it can be quite serious. Remember, they've um, they've got that tooth, that wolf tooth, that's that's very sharp. Um, so tails can can get bitten off. Um, there can become some serious um, open open wounds on the rump there, uh, kicking each other. Um, I mean, remember, zebras are it's a strong animal. If a, if a stallion kicks another one full blown in the head, that could that that may well cause some massive brain injuries. Um, so I myself have never seen it, but it's definitely very possible for that to happen. Um, you know, as a general rule of thumb, I feel like uh, animals don't want to fight to the death. Obviously, um, fighting is a is a risk for the animal that it that it could get. Um, injured um, throughout all species um, you know I feel like if you look at uh, something like a leopard um, you know everybody loves to loves to see a leopard and that's you know maybe one of the animals that uh, when people come from overseas to South Africa and even South Africans a lot of people would love to see a leopard and it's very hard to find but I mean even for a leopard that's that's solitary um, they don't want to fight you know, there's the, there's the sizing up of each other before they will they will actually fight. Um, I guess it's a similar thing for anyalas as well. They also size each other up before they fight. You know, in terms of um, displays, lateral displays, and things like that to each other. 
with with zebras there isn't much uh, sort of sizing up of each other um, but you know the the fights will, will they'll try and make it as, as short and it's obviously intense as possible if they can't find a victor they'll keep fighting um, but yeah that's an interesting question See, we've got a few impalas on the left-hand side starting to get active for the morning as well. I'm maybe slowly going to continue down towards Scotia Dam, see if I can see anything down there. And I think in the meantime, let's take you across to Chris, who's got some birds at the waterhole. As promised, we made our way to Leopard Dam. And we have a woolly neck stork, one of my favorite storks. Just purely because the name is so descriptive with those neck feathers, that fluffy white neck feathers, giving it its name, the woolly necked stork. Earlier, I mentioned how leopard dam now where we are currently which is in the north western parts of Brydens is drying up rapidly even from yesterday to now I can see the shoreline receded more than a meter and that's kind of like where that stalk is walking now hoping that that would expose sort of marine invertebrates crabs perhaps some tadpoles or fish trapped in a small puddle Well, as frogs so now it can use those long legs of it and it can wade in the mud and look for food and that's exactly what it is doing now mm -hmm, got quite a breeze coming up at the moment eh? quite a breeze Like he's targeting something there now. Let's take a look at what that might be. So I'm just gonna see if I can see with my binoculars if he's got something. Oh, not yet. Just lost its balance there. Hi there, Belinda. Belinda wants to know, what does it mean when a stork is voiceless? Well, Belinda, uh, it's, uh, they're often referred to as birds that are voiceless. And that's because most storks are, or the way they make noise is by bull snapping. We refer, we refer to it as bull snapping. They basically clatter the beak together. And that is one of their main communication methods. So they are almost voiceless. So usually the only sound that they make is the bill snapping.
And the reason why they are almost voiceless is that birds that create song and voice in their throat, they've got the vocal organ called the syrinx or syrinx, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And they have a lack of a fully developed syrinx or syrinx. So therefore they can't produce voice as such or what probably could be perceived as voice. And they've developed this alternative method of communication of bull snapping. And now there are some birds that use a combination of mechanical sounds versus voice sounds. If we look at birds like larks for instance, who are great vocalists, but in addition to that, especially the males, they often have some form of wing clapping in flight that often makes additional sounds. So they often refer to as voiceless, but a more correct term would be near voiceless. But these guys do have syrinxes, but they're just not very well developed as a species or as a family. So it's not entirely true that they are totally voiceless, but you can probably say they're near voiceless. I've never heard them make any other sound other than the bull snapping. Shatu Game Reserve has a glowing reputation as one of the most beautiful reserves in Southern Africa. And now, atop a soaring cliff overlooking the Majale River beneath the groves of Euphorbia succulents sits the stunning new Mashatu Euphorbia Villas. These eco-friendly villas echo their beautiful natural surroundings shaped to match the Mapanu parts of Mashatu. Enjoy earthy glamour with a consciousness for conservation woven into every element of these camps within the 32,000 to reserve. And like we were mentioning earlier, I've finally managed to make my way here down to uh, Scotia Dam. We've got a lovely grey heron doing a bit of preening next to the edge of the water there. Yeah, definitely you got to keep those feathers clean, got to 
keep the hygiene levels up. You know, you can imagine for, for a bird like a, like a gray heron that's as big as he is, takes a bit of time but I mean uh, if there isn't that maintenance that upkeep of, of, of feathers and hygiene and things like that you can imagine how that's going to affect the uh, the flight and things like that of uh, of the bird you know if those feathers aren't in mint condition it's it might affect uh, sort of agility of, of flying and things like that so it's definitely very very important to be preening itself And just remember, from uh, the 23rd to the 27th of January, uh, we're going to be doing a back-to-school theme, a back-to-school segment, uh, where we're going to invite lots of uh, classes from schools all around the world to join us for the first hour of uh, Sunset Safari. So if you're a teacher, you can head to uh, wildearth.tv slash kids and you can book your your spot on the virtual safari there. Yeah, definitely exciting stuff. Let's just pan to the left hand side a bit here. Yeah? We've got a few yellow billed ducks that are in the water as well. You can see we've uh, got a little, looks like a blacksmith lapwing in the foreground. Uh, CC, thanks for your question. Um, that's actually a really good one. So preening is basically the process by which uh, a bird like that grey heron that we just saw now um, cleans itself. Um, so that's basically uh, upkeep of, of the condition of the feathers and things like that. So it would be the same as something like a, a two lionesses grooming each other. You know, that helps to, to keep them clean. Uh, molting is is a change in the sort of the physical condition of of the bird um, so maybe uh, going from the the breeding season plumage to to non-breeding season plumage certain um, feathers may may be lost you look at something like a like a wider a lot of the male wider's will lose their will lose their their long feathers and things like that their long tail feathers um, which were obviously there on display for the ladies for them to see um, or more as a as a way to attract the ladies. Um, yeah, it's definitely you look at a lot of the the younger sort of fledglings. Um, you know, they'll molt to get uh, new feathers and things like that. And you think of uh, sort of different processes of molting and birds losing feathers and things like that. The hornbills are always such an interesting one. Um, remember when they, when they, uh, when the female is is going to lay her eggs and things like that, she goes into a cavity and she molts. She loses all of her her feathers and she uses those feathers as like a bedding, as as a lining inside there, um, to to create a nice soft environment. Um, and there's only a slight opening in terms of inside that tree, inside the hole of where she is, and she will rely fully on the male to to provide food for her. Um, because A, it's such a small sort of area and, and they've covered it up with mud and things like that and obviously B, if she's lost her feathers, she can't fly. So it's a, it's a really interesting process. You can see our yellow bull ducks there doing their thing. You can see there we've got a little blacksmith lapwing in the foreground. Picking around looking to see what he can find. And one or two sacred arbors. Yellow bull duck in the foreground. These sacred arbors seem to enjoy it around here. It's uh I'd say it's probably a very productive area to be looking for uh, for any types of uh, food here. Little worms, might even be a little grasshopper or two close to the edge of the water there. Uh, if there's if there were any tadpoles, they'd uh, pick up those little tadpoles.
can see uh, that's our first buffalo coming down to the water today. Like we were mentioning, it's an absolute cooker of a day. And uh, the buffaloes are obviously wanting to get their, their first drink in for the day. Mandy, no, I haven't seen any black herons around. Um, so the most common sort of heron species that we will get here will be the grey heron uh, as well as the black-headed heron. Uh, that uh, the black heron, not the black-headed heron, but the black heron, is a bit more of a a rarity compared to the the uh, grey heron and the black-headed heron. Remember, in terms of size, there'll be a massive difference between the two. Your your grey heron and your black-headed heron probably being about uh, twice the size of, of a black heron. Remember in terms of distribution as well, you shouldn't really be finding black herons down here at Karika. Remember we're all the way down in the Eastern Cape. Um, so normally you're not really going to be finding your black herons here. But never say no. I mean Remember yesterday we were saying you don't usually find bachelor eagles and there was reports of a juvenile bachelor eagle flying around here. So never say never. But those black herons are awesome birds. You know, remember they, um, they will create almost like an umbrella by fanning their wings around themselves um, to, to cast a shadow. Um, so they can kind of see deeper down into the water and I guess you know if there if they are now shadows you know for the birds to at least for the fish to take refuge Now, so obviously it's right at the start of the day, so you can see that the, there's no real rush for these buffaloes to head down to the water. Um, they're more than likely going to drink two or three times today. Um, but just getting a little bit of feeding in and they're definitely heading straight towards the water. Um, and I've been having a, a good look over the past few days carefully at each individual in the herd. Remember we've talked about pathfinders and just trying to see who, who the leaders, who kind of lingering around at the back. And it's been amazing to, to have a good look. Well... Gosh, we've been on a serious mission today. It's been a long time since I've had to drive around so much, but we followed those male leopard tracks. We picked them up, up on them again. They popped back out onto Buyatela Access, and then they marched all the way down and eventually crossed into Simambili over Triple M, over the boundary road. So I just did a little little scan then along Triple M, trying to see maybe if the lions that were supposedly coming north had already crossed but I didn't see any tracks at all. So we're still just going around. I think we were unfortunately about 10 steps behind all the animals today and not, not winning, but we can't win all the time. Let's see. So yeah, so we literally, maybe we're gonna stop and do, a, no, I was gonna say we're gonna stop and do a little bit of birding and then as soon as I mentioned that everything just went poof and flew off in different directions. Might have to resort back to going to giraffe dip where we were yesterday and watching the birds around there because at least they were cooperating. Look and look for the bee eaters. Plus it's been a very, very quiet morning. The impala looked terrified with a few herds that I've seen. It's not been any easy 24 hours for them. And I don't know where the dogs went. I have no idea if they crossed out or if they're still somewhere on the property in the block, maybe just resting. Who knows? Well, not me. I definitely don't know. Come on, something, anything. A dove, we'll take it. One of those days. I thought that everything would have been so happy. It's like, ooh, sun's back out, you know, can 
properly dry off the feathers for a few days. Insects will be back out and about. Not that I've actually seen any this morning. Not at all. But I think this afternoon will be a better afternoon. It's going to be nice and warm today. Not too hot. Per perfect temperature as far as temperatures go. Yeah, so it uh, definitely looks like our herd of buffalo is heading down towards the water hole here. What a lovely view. about the vehicles driving in the foreground there it's definitely an amazing amazing thing to watch buffaloes heading down towards the waterhole so those rangers they've done well there There's no rush in Africa, just taking it easy. And if you look in the background, you can see that road heading up the ridge line there. It's a very scenic reserve, Karika, like we were talking about earlier. Yeah, so it's a little tricky to see from here in terms of herd composition. But I'll definitely point out when uh, when we see the, the pathfinders. Paul, uh, no, the, the leaders won't be male. Uh, the leaders of the herd will be female, what we call pathfinders. Um, and the males will actually generally be closer to the back of the herd. Specifically the ones who are starting to get a little bit older, they will, um, they will scoot around the back. Um, usually it's going to be your females who will be the leaders, known as the pathfinders and um, they will determine where the herd's going to move, when they're going to move, um, basically make the, the, the decisions upon where everybody's going to be going. Right, you can see some of the, the vegetation that we've got here while we wait for those buffaloes to head down. You can see stunning, uh, stunning euphorbias kind of sticking out in the, in the light there. Those lighter colored uh, trees, those will be our, our euphorbia trees. And we've even got a little calf starting to make its way down. Kellyanne, thanks for the question. Uh, no, so infanticide's more going to be related to uh, to your cats, so it's not going to be relevant to buffalo. Oh, look at this female on the right hand side of the frame. She is huge. Big girl.
See a nice big bull coming on the left hand side of the frame there. Oh, it's amazing to see the, the difference in the way that sort of buffalo move throughout the, the course of the day. You know, in the morning now, if they're looking to potentially get a bit of water, kind of quite slow movements. No one's really rushing down to any type of water hole here. Um, so everybody's kind of just taking it easy. You know, whereas if, if it was closer to the end of the day and it had been really hot throughout the course of the day, you'd, you'd start to see a lot more purpose in their movement. You can see everybody's kind of walking, but feeding and slowly going around. Whereas if this was closer to the end of the day, your pathfinder, like we talked about one of your older females, she would be le leading the herd straight down to the water. There wouldn't be much messing around there. Definitely a very peaceful morning here at Karicha. You sometimes see some of the older males squabbling amongst each other and there being a few bellows and prodding and poking of horns, but everybody's quite keen to just take it easy this morning. gentle breeze that's starting to move across the area that's definitely helping to to keep everybody cool Now just having a look at the surrounding area here and it's definitely the buffaloes who've dominated this whole session here not too many other antelopes or animals around for the moment but lovely to have this group of buffalo maybe what I might do is reposition get closer to one of the little mud wallows but in the meantime let's take you across to Tess and see what she's got Sounds like a great plan. Mud wallows, we've come full circle <laughs> from our conversation this morning. We have arrived at Biffles Hook Dam and we're having a look at some of the hanging basket weaver nests. And it seems like the weavers have been quite busy. They've been in and out. These nests are slowly starting to dry out, but there's definitely still the one very green one. But at least we know that we are getting to the stage now where females should be choosing nests and things. Okay, things should be going pretty well. What is on the seat? It's no wonder I didn't see that. I'm not looking backwards. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a moth. It has bright. Oh, where's it gone? Oh! <laughs> it's flitting around. <laughs> gone. That was a beautiful moth. I don't know what kind of moth that was. I just saw black and white spots and then red and it flew away. 
but we'll look for that in the book. We'll try and find out what that is. That was amazing. Okay, back to the weaver's nests. <laughs> Great distraction. I love that. Thank you, Eagle. A little flash of color for the morning. Insects attracted to the dam and everything it brings. But the weavers themselves are obviously getting to that stage now where females should be choosing nests. They should be having babies. And very typical, this is one of the very predictable species you'll find at a dam. A, a southern masked weaver. Let's hope that the male is about to come back. He's been in and out for the last few minutes. I think he's going to be back soon. But the lowest hanging nest, that's kind of just in front of the one at the back, those two at the bottom, that's still the very, very green one. So that one is still under construction. I wouldn't be surprised if they're fine-tuning all of the nests at this point. They're definitely working exceptionally hard. And lucky for them, with this boost of rain, not only does it fill the dams a little bit, but it gives even more grass and supplies to build these incredible structures. Oh, that was a flash of weaver. <laughs> it didn't land there. <laughs> oh, did it? There we go. There's the weaver. Yay. Finally. <laughs> that makes me happy. Okay, it sounds like, oh, there we go, perfect timing. Rolf is ready to say good morning and I'm a Carlos. I'll send you down to the Eastern Cape. Yes, hello, good morning and welcome to the Amakala Game Reserve where we have been able to catch up with a very young little giraffe baby and you can see there's actually the umbilical cord still hanging on there, just on the belly it's a little bit dry like biltong but once it clears the bushes there we'll actually be able to see that the ossicones have actually attached on top of the head so it's more than a week old because otherwise they lie down like that flat when they're born up until about a week now my name is Ralph Kirsten on the camera I've got BK with me how's it BK and how's it once again to all of you so back to our little star here the more than a week's old little baby giraffe but this is a new one for me I haven't seen this one and it's out here on the western side of the reserve closer to the dune forest so this is my favorite part of the reserve I must say it's uh, a lot easier to track um, because here it's quite sandy so you can actually see the tracks whereas on the eastern side it's a lot of clay and uh, if it's not wet it uh, turns to concrete so nice little baby giraffe on my favorite side of the reserve mommy ever watchful and just uh, looking after the little one now this is obviously a different one to the one that we saw when I was previously here at Amakala, when uh, the cheetah were actually circling while the female was giving birth. And there we can just see it through the sweet thorn. And there's quite a lot of zebra moving around as well. There's also a couple of foals with the zebra too. And I've got reports on the cheetah the three male coalition they still haven't caught anything yet so it's almost getting to a bit of a worrying point now but uh, we'll maybe try and catch up with them again this afternoon they do need to eat soon so they'll be hunting and they'll be on the lookout for food this little youngster making friends with a zebra Darian, good question. It's um, it's not easy to tell the gender straight after birth. I'm just getting my binos on this one and seeing if I can tell. Um, they do have external testes, um, but I think this might be a female. Female. 
So yes, yeah, I think definitely a female, a little girl. I'm going to make a combination of the thorns and the bark. That's what I'm going to do. It's basically just a very big open system. But aren't they pretty? Thank you for joining us and have a fantastic morning. Finally, we have found a herd of elephants. I was just bragging about all the elephants that are currently on Pride Lands. It literally took us nearly an entire safari to find some elephants. We have a young bull close to us, but this, this is indeed a breeding herd. There's a whole bunch of them further into the bush who. Uh, seem to be moving or well, browsing in a north slightly northwestern direction I think there's a great opportunity to just sit and have a nice peaceful moment with this elephant having its breakfast Wow, what's flying here? It's a right, I'm gonna give that one to our viewers. So what do we have? White underparts, sort of dark 
chest and head. No spots on the chest, on the white chest. That's a pure, or not, but on the belly rather. And then that characteristic lines in the underside, in the rear parts of, of the wings and the underside. So let's see if anybody can guess this eagle. Typical way of this family of eagles is that sort of very slow gliding flight accompanied by a bit of wing. So they turn into the wind, flap, 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 flap. And then they try and gain a bit of height. And then they turn back into the wind. And that's when they slow down. Because it will still create lift, as we can see there. And that's almost as if they hover. You see, they're now it's turned into the wind. Now they're very, very still. And you can see how it's going up now. It's creating lift. Now it's missed that thermal. Just trying to catch it now. And it's looking for specific reptiles by doing that. It's hovering up like that. Sarah says it is a martial eagle. Sarah, I'm going to quickly get one of my books out. And we can take a look at the martial eagle. And I'm going to show you why it is unfortunately not a martial eagle. Martial eagle, okay, it's difficult for you to see the size of this bird. If we go back to the books, let's take a look. All right, so with the martial eagle, if we look at the flight, all right, remember we've got the bird in flight. So the martial eagle, similar to this bird, it's got a white belly and the dark head. But this bird's wings are white on the other side as well, and it's got those lines. Marshall Eagle will have dark wings on the other side. Under side. All right. I'm still waiting for one or two more answers, but if I'm not going to get them, then I'll proceed to tell you what particular eagle this is. So this particular eagle have white underwings. As you can hopefully see, it's a bit far from us. A Kuvuki says a Wahlberg's eagle. Kuvuki, unfortunately, also not a Wahlberg's eagle. You do get pale forms of Wahlberg's eagles, but it's not a Wahlberg's eagle, unfortunately. All right, I'm going to show you what it is. Aiden says it's a black-chested snake eagle, and Aiden is 100% correct. Now, remember I said it's got white underparts, white underwings, and then those black lines that are very characteristic, and then the dark chest and head. It's not really black, it's more like a dark brown. I mean, the martial eagle will have dark underwings, very dark, almost, more, almost like the head and the wings are on one plane when they fly. So that, combined with its flight pattern, very characteristic of a black-chested snake eagle. And at the same time, our elephants seem to have moved off. <laughs> yeah. That was a lovely sighting. That's... And... It's lovely to see raptors while you're looking at something else. Sometimes we try and frame up raptors and because of the way they fly and disappear it's often difficult to maintain visual on them until such time that the the feed can actually come to us that's just the nature of what happens out in the bush you can't dictate the movement of animals it's very very difficult at times whereas while you're in another sighting and you suddenly have that opportunity it's very quickly while you're already live 
and we can just switch to the visual on the bird. In this case, it worked out perfectly. All right. There's no way to get to these ellies now. They've moved deeper into the bush and there's no road there. And as you know, I'm relatively reluctant to follow elephants off-road. Oh, I love a black-chested snake eagle. Don't get to see them very often, unfortunately. We had a brown snake eagle and it flew away as we were getting close enough to actually view it. <laughs> Sneaky and cheeky. But I've just introduced Igor to the very dark form of the Wolfberg's eagle. That very dark, deep, dark chocolate color. Stunning. Just flying over and disappeared. Interesting update, which I'm sure Taylor will enjoy. We have found wild dog tracks crossing north into Bivol's Hook. <laughs> so that doesn't really help anything, but I know she was looking for them, so. I don't know, this is maybe a separate pack. I think this might be a different pack that's been milling around, because I, I can't see that the ones that were, if she was tracking a chair pad would have come all the way back. But again, wild dogs, they do move like that. Like a very messy hair day for me. Okay, so we've been looking for the buffaloes as well. We found their tracks crossing north into Biffle's Hook. We have got lots of hyena tracks here, so that just reinforces the dogs were here. And our Gallagher shortcuts, so we're hoping there is still time for a little last minute leopard. Maybe Clanamba will pop up. That would be good. Little last minute spot. Spot pattern, spotty look. This is why the animals are so different today to yesterday. Not only because of the rain, but because of the wind. Everybody's nervous and they've moved and taken advantage of the change. Yeah, as you can see, uh a portion of our herd of buffaloes has come down to one of the little mud wallows here. One or two of them have kind of rolled around a little, nothing too significant. Definitely been a very relaxing morning here. And remember, if you haven't been able to join us for the full show, you can head onto our app and uh, watch some of the highlights, watch some of the little best bits of, uh, of the sunrise show, if you weren't able to join us for the whole, the whole time. Definitely a Sunday morning for these buffalo. These, bu uh, these buffalo offer a, a little bit of a feed it seems now. And definitely if you have a look at uh, 
pretty much all of them they're looking in amazing condition um, you know their black hides kind of glistening in the sunlight you can see uh, this calf closest to us having a little bit of a suckle there so the game here at Karika is thriving everybody's loving the summer conditions that we've got and I'm sure at some point today we'll uh, we'll see this herd of buffaloes coming back down to either mud wallow or to head down to some of the water holes to to have a drink but we will move around see what else we can find heading into escape to nature but you never know at some point in time I, I'd put my money on uh, seeing this herd of buffalo again it's been a lovely peaceful morning here with them at Karika So if you've got the time, stick around with us and uh, relax as we go into our Escape to Nature show. Take it easy, everybody. Mm -hmm.